on the blue. Hi guys, this is Charles. I'm one of the surgeons at South Falls. Uh, today we are taking out um, a couple of lymph nodes in a dog for it's actually interesting, unknown primary tumor. Um, so this is a 10-year-old uh, Cavoodle or a Cavalier Poodle Cross who presented with a history of, the, of a mass in the popliteal region. Um, and so an aspirate on that mass was done, which was consistent with high-grade mast cell disease. And then we did a CT scan for staging and found that there was another node in the sublumbar region, and we still can't find the primary tumor. So the idea is that uh, tumors are usually more chemoresponsive if you can cytoreduce them down as much as you can, get it down to microscopic disease. Um, and so that is what we are doing. So we're going in and removing the sublumbar lymph node um, first, and then we'll go and take out that popliteal lymph node as well. Um, and, um, and then once we get histopath back, we'll decide what kind of chemo is indicated. Um, just a comment to Bianca, our intern, we need to make sure that we submit that first C-kit analysis as well. Um, so we're going to do C-kit analysis, um, number one, to contribute to the diagnosis of mast cell disease, and number two, to see whether palladia would be appropriate. Um, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our channel. Make sure you turn on notifications so you'll get a little ding on your phone when we are live streaming. Um, if you have any questions, we do have the live chat running, and we'd be happy to answer them if we can, if I'm not concentrating too much. Now, if you look at the CT scan, uh, which is up on the field, you can see an area which is circled in green, and that is the sublumbar lymph node on the left-hand side. And um, you can see that there's some big, scary white structures that are right next to the lymph node, and so those are the iliac vessels. And um, so there is a risk of hemorrhage and of damaging those blood vessels, so we'll have to be really careful while we're in there. Um, So just dissecting down onto the rectus fascia. So the question on do you plan to do intraoperative cytology to confirm mast cell tumor? Uh, I am not going to do intraoperative cytology. We'll send it off for histopath. The only reason, well, the reason why I'm not going to do intraoperative cytology is because it's not going to change what we're going to do. Um, so it would just only be for interest sake, and I'm happy to do that if... Um, uh, and the way that I would do it would be to remove the, the lymph node and then just do some impression smears um, on a slide. And if, um, Bianca, you want to do that for interest's sake, you're welcome to. Uh, we'll have a look. I hadn't actually, the liver and spleen are grossly normal on CT. That's a good question, though. Um, and if I happen to be able to see the liver from this approach, we might go ahead and do a little liver biopsy as well. Thanks for whoever that was. Thanks for thinking of that. That's a good idea. Um, is it still on CT there? That's weird. All right. So anyway, just um, just where it says PIP, the green button that says PIP. Uh, yep. Just push that, and then I'll get rid of that. So just getting rid of some falciform fat. So guys, don't let me forget to sample the liver if we can get to it. So I can see the stomach, which means we should be able to get to the liver. Uh, so this dog got probably methadone on induction, and now it's on a fentanyl CRI. Is it on fentanyl CRI or just fentanyl boluses? Fentanyl boluses to keep it asleep. If we have trouble um, with pain relief during the procedure, we'll go to a fentanyl CRI, a constant rate infusion.
So we're getting rid of the falciform. Get our gelpies in here. And I am going to extend my incision all the way back to the pubis. All right, so the urinary bladder is here, colon is here, and from the CT, I know that the mass or the lymph node is right here, um, so I can feel that. And so we'll just get some retraction here. Oh, there's a ureter. Not sure if you guys can see that, but that's the ureter sitting right there, so obviously that's something that we need to be aware of. Are you guys on a stool? I might switch sides with you. Okay, so Bianca, I'm just going to get you to retract on the colon. So there's ureter sitting right there. So that's something to be aware of. Let's get a lap sponge in here as a retractor. Michael, I'm going to reach your hand and lay it just down right there. Just try to get all those guts out of the way. So let's get this. Hold on just a second. Get that underneath and then get your finger right up in there to retract that. So ureter is sitting right in the way here. Um, can I get uh, electric cautery turned down to 20, please? Um, Victor, can you see what I'm doing there pretty well? Yeah. Great. Let's just get that a little bit deeper in there. All right, so the ureter is right in the way, and I'm just dissecting down through the retroperitoneal fat. So I can see the big vessel pumping right on top of where I want to be. These are the iliac vessels and they always say, don't cut anything you know the name of. So sadly, I know the name of that, so I'll have to be pretty careful. Um, can you get a finger deeper in there? All right, so that's the big iliac vessel sitting right on top, pumping away. So I'm just dissecting around that. I think you're going to have to get a hand in there, sorry. Uh, I think a hand with the spread fingers right in there. Michael, try to get that fat as well with your fingers. A little bit deeper in. Yep. I'm just going to use my ligature. I don't know what's in the middle of that, but... Don't want to take any chances.
Is there some risk if we manipulate this too much that we could get degranulation? Um, I I don't really see that as a as an issue. Um, and I've taken off a lot of mast cell tumors, um, but I know that some people will pre-treat them with neuramine, chlorpheniramine. And I'm also trying to be very gentle with this lymph node because I want it out in one piece because um, if we split the lymph node open, I guess there's potential for release of cancer cells into the vicinity. Just can't get a grip on it. As I was pushing through the um, ligature, the leg jumped a little bit, so I'm probably pretty close to the um, sciatic nerve roots. So that's something else I've got to watch out for. And I have inadvertently damaged uh, sacral nerve roots, taking out a lymph node like this before. Can I get somebody to reflect on that, please? So that node is out there, and we don't have any significant bleeding. You can really clearly see the ureter sitting right there in the field. So let's get some saline and lavage that. So we can let all that go. We'll have a peek up and see if we can see the liver. Let's just lift up here. Yes, I can see liver. I don't know if you guys can see liver, but I can see it. Okay, so just lift up on that. Um, so just to reiterate, um, for those of you that were late for class. Um, so we were taking out sublumbar lymph nodes in a dog that has an unknown primary probable mast cell tumor. So we've taken out the um, sublumbar lymph node and now we're going for a liver biopsy. See if there's evidence of metastasis to the liver. And we just need to cauterize the liver surface. Can you get some fingers in here and lift up that fat? Thank you. OK, 
Okay. All right. So I'll go ahead and close. Can I get some 2.0 PDS, please? Remember that when you aren't exactly on midline or caudally where there's no uh, linear alba, you don't need to close both internal and external rectus fascia. All you need to close is the external rectus fascia. Get some scissors, please. Just about four mils long. Thank you. Get you to run that for me, please. Uh, it's a 10 year old cavoodle, so Cavalier King Charles uh, poodle cross. And always just simple continuous in the linea alba. Uh, you don't need to do simple interrupted here as long as you're confident in your two knots at both ends. Some people will do a continuous interrupted. Um, I don't. I just do a uh, straight continuous. So by continuous interrupted, that means doing like five or six bites and then stopping and tying a knot, doing five or six and tying a knot. My feeling is that if you've got, if any one of those breaks down, you're still gonna have dehiscence and evisceration. And so I don't know that it makes, I'd rather instead of having 20 knots that you're counting on, I'd rather just have two. So here I'm coming over and just getting external rectus fascia because as we've discussed in the past, dogs don't have a linea alba caudally. So just getting external rectus fascia right there. Some big vessels right there. Those would be the epigastrics. Coming out of the inguinal ring. I'll try not to grab onto those.
And then when I'm finished closing this, we'll go over and remove that popliteal lymph node. I don't think so. I don't think I've got any more surgery today. Unless I get emergencies, I don't think I'm going to be live streaming anything further. Nice. So we are just closing up an abdomen. We've just removed um, sublumbar lymph nodes from an unknown primary, which has metastasized to both the sublumbar lymph nodes and popliteal lymph nodes. So we've just taken out the sublumbar, and when we finish closing this, we'll go and remove the popliteal lymph node on the left side. Let me get some 3 0 um, monison, please. What's the question regarding the FP4 from last night? The what? Um, FP4, the yeah, yeah. Um, someone asked what's the worst that can happen if you remove two muscles in the uh, So, good question. Um, if you remove too much of the neck of the femur, like, if, like basically you can remove the entire neck. If you were to damage or remove the greater trochanter, um, then you'd get into real problems with supporting the leg um, and normal function of the leg. But as long as the greater trochanter is intact, um, it's like some people intentionally remove the lesser trochanter. Uh, and so I don't, uh, but uh, so as long as that le uh, greater trochanter is left intact with the attachments of the gluteal muscles, uh, your internal obturator, your gamelli, um, uh, those uh, muscle groups, then you should be fine. little slip knot in my suture.
So we have three interns scrubbed in with us on this surgery. Do you guys have any questions for the interns? About what life as an intern is like or? Um, I don't know of any other vets doing live streaming routinely. There is a surgeon, I think, in Russia that occasionally does the odd live stream, um, but I'm not aware of anybody else. What's the question? What's it like being an intern? Yeah. <laughs> Bianca, what's it like being an intern? Oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> On the spot. It's Bianca. really good. Um, I have learned a lot. It is a lot of work, but it's worth it, I think. Um, so Bianca is just finishing her internship. Here has been with us for a year. She's currently applying for jobs, if you know of anybody who's looking. Medicine focus, great intern, hard working, <laughs> great, team, great team, player. Thanks, Charles. <laughs> quite, I have a comment that she's quite funny as well, so good sense of humor. Would have excellent skills regarding pain relief, perioperative care, chemotherapy, preferably in Australia. <laughs> Hopefully in Melbourne. You can put in your request for a CV on the messages at the end of the video. How about the aspirations of the new interns? All right, so we have an internal question for the aspirations of the new interns. I know that Siobhan probably is thinking about internal medicine, possibly of cats. Is that correct? And Michael, yeah. what are you thinking about? I'm on the fence. On the fence. <laughs> I love my surgery, but I also like the, uh, the puzzles of medicine. So like surgery and the puzzles of medicine. Definitely go the surgery route. <laughs> no bias there. No bias. We get enough puzzles. So obviously our interns here occasionally get put on the spot like I just did. Mm -hmm. There's someone that says that it's much better in Perth, so I should move there. Right. Do they have a job for you? <laughs> Unsure. They didn't comment. Mm -hmm. Bianca's already applied to a couple of high-quality practices in the area. So I'm sure she'll have no problem getting snapped up. Although her, the only downside to her application is that I'm one of her references. <laughs> Hopefully she'll get a job despite that. So that was just an Aberdeen knot. Bianca, I'm going to switch sides with you again in just a minute. Okay. All right, and we'll pull that up like this. Is that right in the middle of the field? Yep. Yeah. Perfect. So just internally rotate that. All righty. So now we're going after this popliteal lymph node. So I can palpate it right here. You can see it, it's almost like a testicle underneath the skin. So I'll just make a skin incision right over the top of it. And I'm trying not to cut all the way into the lymph node.
you can have a branch of the saphenous vein back here that you have to watch out for. So you can see that the node is coming out just like a testicle, okay? And then there's a bruise in it from where they aspirated, aspirated it previously. Can I have somebody pinch that? few big vessels down here, but I don't know the name of them, so we should be safe. Now there's a big branch of the saphenous right down there. I don't know if you can see that big saphenous there. There's a big lymph node. Especially for a little dog. Yeah. Being medicine focused, Bianca, this should get you a bit excited. Big old lymph node. It does, especially knowing that the dog has mast cell disease. And Bianca, would you be comfortable in general practice treating a mast cell disease patient with chemo? Yes, very much. So there you go. There you have it. <laughs> You're trying I to quite like the chemo, actually. You want to add chemo to your general practice repertoire? Bianca is your definite candidate. Okay, so that's the lymph node out there. Okay, and we've got no bleeding going on in here. So we've got semi-tendinosis over here, semi-membranosis over there. Just make sure, got a little bit of a bleeder right there. All righty. And I'll just close those two muscle bellies back together. Turning off the ventilator? Yep, great. So as we come, so we've uh, mechanically ventilate all of our patients in surgery. Um, just makes the anesthetic a bit smoother because you're forcing the anesthetic drug into the lungs and also making sure you don't get out at atelectasis and that kind of thing. And then as we're coming to the end of the surgery, we switch back to manual, as in um, spontaneous ventilation. So that transition is, can be a little bit tricky because sometimes if they, especially if you get the CO2 too low with your mechanical ventilation, they're reluctant to start breathing spontaneously. Yep. Um, I want to ask if the four limb amputation that you did the other day was that a cadaver? Uh, the four limb amputation that I did yesterday, in fact, was not a cadaver, and it's on its way home today. So um, I assume that they're asking because of the lack of bleeding, um, but that's just from being careful and using appropriate electric cautery and knowing your anatomy and stuff. Uh, probably, so that's a great question, probably not hard at all. Um, can you finish that up for me, please? Probably not hard at all because we have had human nurses working in um, veterinary hospitals before. So I would think that that would be um, pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, it's, the instruments are all the same um, and the prep's all the same and stuff like that. So, um, and then uh, this comment from Curtis, about ligature, so yes, that definitely helps with the amputation and preventing bleeding. So anyway, um, thank you very much
for watching. And I'm not sure if I'm going to live stream anything else today. I don't have anything else planned right now, but I may try to do the tour of the hospital. So um, anyway, so Namufu has asked, um, uh, who's a human tech, um, looking at vet tech, where are you located? Um, because if you were in Melbourne, you could come by and see us. Anyway, so thank you very much for watching, and um, I hope to see you again soon.